So you can come. I'm 
to see everybody here in the same room, even though it's very warm. Um, um, wonderful to be back. Um, as many of you will know, the Amsterdam Lecture was established uh, in 2016 by the legal theory group of the, uh, the law school here at the University of Glasgow, with aim not only of recognizing uh, the work of Adam Smith and his association with the University of Glasgow, but also to give contemporary shape to his distinctive approach to jurisprudence and study of law and institutions of government. So Smith, as, as is well known, understood jurisprudence as part of the theory of the general principles of law and government. And his approach was concerned with understanding the historical development of forms of law and government and how these related to the social and economic development of the societies and government. In these lectures, then, some of the world's most distinguished legal and political philosophers, uh, whose ideas like Smith's uh, have reached beyond narrow disciplinary understandings of jurisprudence. The, in these lectures, people have addressed these key philosophical, political, and social aspects of law and government. And today's speaker, I'm very pleased to say, continues uh, this tradition. Uh, with her work, which has focused on the ethical limits of markets, the place of equality and just society, theories of rational choice, feminist philosophy and ethics and education. Deborah Sachs, our speaker today, is the Vernon R. and Elizabeth Warren Anderson Dean of the School of Humanities and Sciences at Stanford University. She's the Master Sutton Weeks Professor of Ethics in Society and Professor of Philosophy. Among her publications are well known why some things should not be for sale, um, the moral limits of markets, also economic analysis, moral philosophy, and public policy in 2016. And today she's going to talk to us on the topic uh, when cash is not enough, the role of in kind goods. She's going to talk for around 45 minutes, after which there'll be time for some questions uh, and answers, hopefully. And after that, uh, 
we'll move from here to the reception in uh, room 207, 10 square, and we'll go into you over there uh, afterwards. Okay, but for now, I'll hand you over to Deborah Sachs. Thanks. I'm going to probably stand. Everybody can hear me? That's great. Um, so thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm really uh, honored to be here and to present a work that's still in progress. So I hope there will be lots of questions. There may not yet be answers to the questions that you're asking. So my topic is um, when cash is not enough the case for in-kind distribution. And I take some of my, uh, my playbook from the economist uh, James Tobin, who writing in 1970 distinguished between what he called general egalitarianism, which is achieved through taxation and cash transfers, and what he termed specific egalitarianism which limits the scope of inequality by taking some things out of the market realm, like education or healthcare um, or childcare. While roughly half of all government aid takes the form of in-kind transfers of things like healthcare and education, food stamps, disability accommodation, job training, economists, and many philosophers tended to focus their attention instead on cash and not in kind. Um, they've been what Tobin called general egalitarians, those who are egalitarian, and not specific egalitarians. So Tobin noted, here's a quote, while the concerned layman who observed people with shabby housing or too little to eat instinctively want to provide them with decent housing and adequate food, economists instinctively want to provide them with more cash income. They can then buy the housing and food if they want to, and if they choose not to, the presumption is that they have a better use for their money. And um, uh, you and Reinhardt, uh, was an economist at Princeton, and called this uh, Economics 101. Right, the idea that cash is superior to in kind is just like a fundamental, right? It makes no sense uh, for many economists, although I'll give you a couple of circumstances where um, that has to be qualified. So, economists tend to think the problem with in kind benefits over cash is it's inefficient, right? The, per, the recipient probably has something else they would prefer to do. Um, and if you gave them the cash, they could direct the cash to their most preferred outcome. Philosophers tend to think that in-kind goods are paternalists. That is, that they substitute somebody else's um, view about what's good for people with the person's own view, right? So in this case, the state is substituting its view about what you should want for your own view of what you should want. And Tobin doesn't say this, but Tobin actually endorses, uh, at least one way of reading the essay is he endorses a kind of paternalism, right? So if you like paternalism, no problem with in-kind goods. If you um, uh, don't like efficiency, maybe there's a, you know, an argument, but if you accept anti-paternalism, and a place for efficiency-based arguments, then you've got to answer these objections. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna spend just a bit of time kind of getting you to, making the negative case that there are answers to these objections, that these objections are not fatal. And then the bulk of what I wanna do is try to give you a positive case, that there's something in kind wood distribution can do that um, uh, cash distribution can't do. And that is um, some kinds of in-kind goods that we share together, create a community where people who are different 
and disagree about lots of things, see themselves as uh, members of a common project. And I'll note, although I won't talk about it here, the kind of argument I'm making is actually an argument um, that could be used to defend the draft for military service as opposed to um, a volunteer army. But I'm not going to make that case here. I made that case in other places. Not a popular case. But. <laughs> um, all right. So let me just note two caveats to my argument. So first, although I'll be saying that in-kind goods have an important role to play in egalitarian thinking, so does cash distribution. So I'm not arguing that there is no role for cash distribution. I'm simply arguing that it's, it can't do all the work that egalitarians want um, it to do and that we need to rely on other measures. And one implication of this is for those egalitarians who like um, something like a basic income and think that, you know, having a basic income is a substantial solution to some of the um, evils of capitalism, this is going to be an argument that it can't do some of the things we need um, you know, uh, taming capitalism or finding an alternative to capitalism to do. And second, I do want to note um, that most people who reject in-kind distribution do make a couple of exceptions. So think about votes. Um, Tobin noted in his essay that any first-year economics student could show you that um, it was inefficient, right? to give people votes and not allow them to trade them away or sell them, right? Because then they get money and they can buy things they might value more than votes. But most of us don't think it would be a good idea um, to distribute votes by market. So Tobin himself thinks it's paternalism that people will make bad choices. But I'm gonna argue, no, there's a democratic reason for not distributing votes. And that democratic reason has implications for other in-kind goods like healthcare, childcare, um, and so on. Uh, and the other kind of good economists um, uh, think it uh, shouldn't be distributed by market, but maybe should be distributed in kind or what are called pure public goods. So goods that are non-excludable and non-rival, so take national defense. Um, no one proposes having a market um, in national defense. People, of course, have a market in private defense, but national defense is something that we actually, the state provides in kind. Okay, so those are uh, limits that people um, accept, even if, they're uh, anti-paternalist and pro-efficiency. Um, but in general, if you're an economist, and for many um, philosophers, you don't want to go beyond this narrow range of goods. Um, and I want to note that a lot of goods that we, as I said, the state provides are distributed in kind and it's not obvious that these, this can be defended on those bases. And in fact, I think it can. Let me just give you an example from uh, um, an egalitarian philosopher. So uh, Philip von Parijs um, uh, argued in his book, Real Freedom for All, that the only justification for in-kind health provision for giving people um, access to health care um, is uh, that we can only give it to the level that a, a reasonable person would have chosen to insure against it um, if they'd been in a position to insure, let's say, at birth. Um, that'll get you, I'm sure, some level of health uh, provision, but it won't get you anything like the level of health provision most of societies provide as an entitlement to all citizens. So there's a shared view out there that cash is, in general, 
superior to in-kind good distribution. And I want to contrast that with an older tradition of egalitarian thought. That tradition, and it is a British uh, tradition, uh, which includes people like Tawny, uh, William Morris, G.D.H. Cole, T.H. Marshall. On their view, some goods play a fundamental role in structuring social relations between people so that people can live together as equals. And that's the argument I'm going to develop in my positive case. So let me go quickly through the negative case. So the on efficiency, um, as I said, it's a pretty straightforward argument. Right, give people cash, they can direct it to their um, highest uh, preference, they get the most satisfaction, give them, uh, you know, a, a, um, health care, they might not need it, they might choose to do something else, and so it's less efficient. Now, that argument only goes through if there are no market imperfections, and of course, there are many, many market imperfections. And in cases of market imperfections, so for example, where people don't have <coughs> adequate information about um, the choices that they're making, or where people are making choices that affect third parties, right? The argument for um, cash over in kind, right? It may not be more efficient. It might actually be less efficient. And in my um, earlier book, I talk about these as cases of weak agency, right? Where people are not fully rational um, agents making decisions. And that's often the case in the decisions um, that people are making. So market imperfections give rise to a couple of, our, of reasons you could prefer in kind distribution. So first, supposing you want to, you're thinking about, should I give cash or should I give something like a in-kind transfer, let's say a housing voucher. I could give people cash or I could give them a housing voucher. Well, how do I decide who I'm going to give the cash to? If I want to target, right, it actually might be more efficient if I want to target, if I don't want to give a, um, cash to people who don't need it for housing. It might be easier to do it with an in-kind provision because there I can have the housing be of a kind that people who have more money are not going to want to use the voucher for that housing. So it's easier. So targeting gives you, in some cases, a reason to prefer in-kind to cash. A second reason um, is that some forms of in-kind provision have the effect of transferring resources from parents to children, or in some cases from fathers to mothers. So take, again, education or food, right? If you give it to parents, most parents do care about their kids, and most of them will spend it on their kids um, and feed them and but not necessarily, right? And some of the resources might go for other, um, for other goals. In particular, so there's an interesting study um, uh, by an economist that looked at poor families in India and found in this study, and the woman's name, she's actually also English, Renika Kira, I mean, she's Indian, but teaches in a British university, she found that um, women overwhelmingly preferred in kind of distribution to cash distribution because the husbands took the cash distribution and siphoned some of it off to um, alcohol and other women and cigarettes, and they had less to feed their children or themselves. So sometimes, tar sometimes in kind has the effect of getting the good to the person who's the most vulnerable, who might also have weak agency like children do in families, but so often do women. 
And the third reason why you might think um, in kindness would be preferable is that um, uh, there are coordination problems that occur. This is another, maybe it's a market imperfection, but take healthcare to actually have a healthcare system that works. You have to prevent healthy people from defecting, right? Because if healthy people defect from the healthcare system, that drives the cost up. So one way to do that, now you could do that through cash, but you can't guarantee if you give people cash, they'll use it on healthcare. So one way to do it is to distribute healthcare to everybody, whether they want to use it or not, right? To solve the problem of uh, the coordination problem. So that's just to say, it doesn't follow from the fact that in-kind distribution is often inefficient, that it's always inefficient. That's negative case number one. But you might say, who cares about that? The real objection to in-kind distribution is paternalism, right? Um, you're basically substituting somebody's judgment, in this case, the state's judgment, for another person's judgment, the recipient's judgment, over um, their own welfare. And people should have the right to decide for themselves what they're, what gives them welfare. And to distribute in kind then is to disrespect them, right? It's to have what sometimes is called a nanny state, right? That treats um, adults as um, children who can't make rational decisions. And obviously, well, I shouldn't say obviously, but um, much in-kind distribution has had paternalistic justifications. Um, food stamps in America is one case. I've already given you a, a, what look, could look like a paternalist case in the Indian context, right? The men will spend it on um, you know, on, on alcohol and uh, cigarettes and not on uh, meeting the needs of their families. And it's important always to know that the objection to the paternalist objection to in time provision doesn't require, right, that the person knows better themselves than the state. Right, that's not what the objection is. The objection is even if the state is right about what is in somebody's interest, it shouldn't be substituting um, its interests or its view of your interests, I should say. It shouldn't be substituting its view of your interests for your own view of your interests. Um, so many people think, look, all in-kind distribution has often been justified as on paternalist grounds. It's easy to give paternalist um, justifications. And in fact, we should be suspicious of any in-kind distribution, given how easy it is to come up with paternalist reasons for in-kind distribution. And if we are anti-paternalist, that's going to basically tie our hands with respect to in-kind distribution. So is that a good argument? So can you go from the fact that often, and maybe always, you can construct a paternalist argument for in-kind provision to the idea that it's necessarily the case that in-kind provision is paternalist. And here, I think that argument doesn't go through. So let me just say a little bit about why I think it doesn't go through. To see why it doesn't go through, you have to start with the question, why am I obligated? Or why is the state obligated in the first place? Or why am I obligated in the first place to pay taxes? I can't assume that I have, right, and then ask, what form it should take. First, I have to think about what's the basis of that obligation that the state has to its members, that I have to my fellow citizens. Um, if it's the case, supposing I have a rights-based view 
right? I think people have some fundamental rights and that the, um, the, the justification of transfers, right, whether cash or in kind, is to protect and sustain those rights. Well, then it's, it could be the case that in kind provision does a better job than cash does in securing people's rights. And that's, you know, an empirical question. But the fact that it's an empirical question, I think, suggests it can't be a priori or the fact that it's necessarily the case that if it's in kind, it's paternalist. Because if we think, you know, the reasons we have, right, to pay taxes is to create some kind of community, right, of free and equal citizens, then we just have to ask what discharges that obligation best. To use um, a well-known example of uh, Tim Scanlon's, the fact that somebody really cares most about building a monument to their God doesn't mean I have to pay taxes. You know, it doesn't obligate me, right, to contribute to that end of theirs. The reason I have to contribute to their ends is, again, you know, either because I want to um, respond to urgent needs or because I care about a community, building a community of equals, a justified community of equals. So I don't think the paternalism argument blocks um, in kind provision. So now I want to return to the positive argument. Those are the negative arguments that just says hands are on high, you can accept anti-paternalism and you can think um, efficiency is important and still favor in-kind distribution. But I want to now give a positive argument um, and it's a democratic argument. So let's just start with the idea of democracy. We used to take it for granted, um, can't do that anymore. And one of the things that we're seeing around the world is heterogeneity. Societies that are increasingly heterogeneous, which is actually a, I think, positive thing, are also straining, right, to create a sense of common, a common commitment, common community, common identity. So when you bring people together who differ on so many dimensions that they see themselves as virtual strangers, and that happens because of class differences, racial and ethnic differences, national differences, language, culture, religion. There are many, many ways we have of dividing each other. Um, and so one question democracies always have faced, but face more than ever now in a global world, in a globalized world, is how you create enough commonality between people who differ on many, if not most dimensions, so that they see themselves as members, right, of a democratic polity that they're committed to. Um, in the United States, they actually not only do white and black Americans live very different lives, but the lives of the people in the bottom quintile and the people in the top quintile are more disparate than ever. There are very, very few places where you come together in society and you see um, people from different walks of life who are different than you in the United States. In fact, the only place I know of is the DMV, the Department of Motor Vehicles, which everybody has to go to. And it's the one place you actually see like a random sampling of the United States. But um, so I want to, given this problem of democracy, I want to suggest three roles that in kind goods play. Enabling social integration, providing common experiences, and protecting the least well off. Am I doing? Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, so let's start with social integration. Um, one of the great things about markets, one of the benefits of a market is markets are very individualizing, right? I go to the 
grocery store, I can choose what I most want and I can separate myself from the rest of you, which is really good. I don't want to have to buy the same like soda you buy or the eat the same food you eat or um, and I, you know so I markets can allow lots of room for individual decision making, which is great, but it's not always great. And so I want to contrast two ways of providing public education. One is by um, what I'll call a socialist way of distributing public education, which is to have the education system be a mix of the people who live in the community. And let's assume we have an integrated community. So the, this was the idea in the United States, was, the movement was for common schooling, right? Everybody should go to the same kind of schools and they should see, right, other people from all different walks of life and different ethnicities. Um, and that's obviously not um, a perfectly realized system. We don't fully have common schools in the United States. That we have actually quite segregated schools. But the idea of common schooling, right, is an idea of an income. You're trying to deliver an in-kind good to people. You're trying to deliver an integrated school to people. And you can contrast that with another way of distributing schooling, which um, Milton Friedman made the case for in um, Capitalism and Freedom, which is another way of distributing common schooling is to give parents, so here's a kind of not a full market, but a restricted market, give them a voucher that they can use and take to the school of their choice, right? And you might think, isn't that good? That's going to be efficient because then schools have to compete for the vouchers and parents can shop around and they can figure out what works best for their kid. But there's a problem with that. Um, and actually, there's a problem that's been studied in the United States, which is it turns out um, systems that try to distribute schooling in this way are more segregated by race and class than our public schools are in the United States. And our public schools are pretty segregated. Now, why would that be? Well, no parent on their own, right, can bring about an integrated school, right? That depends on all of us doing it together. I'm, if I'm just deciding as an individual, I can't create right an integrated school. I might, you know, be willing to do my part if you were willing, but I might not be sure. Education is also something really hard to assess the quality of. And so parents who want the best for their kids look for other markers. And one of the markers parents tend to look at is the class and racial composition of the school. And that's, you know, so. Common schools, in common, vouchers, you don't get uh, common schools and you don't get integrated schools. Any? All right, so that's one example. Let me give you a second example. If you don't, if you don't buy that example, let me give you a second example. I think it's probably a better example. So think about disability accommodation which is something that we provide in kind. We provide it in kind by, for example, having ramps into buildings so that there are staircases, designing aisles so that um, wheelchairs can get through. But there's another way you could distribute um, disability accommodation. You could give cash to people who are disabled so they could buy Right, somebody to carry them over the steps, so somebody to shop for them, um, you know, all kinds of th things that we do. Um, we could give them money so that they could remove some of these hurdles for themselves. But notice what cash wouldn't do, right? It wouldn't integrate them into the society's whole members. They'd be carried over. 
right? The the every the the, um, uh, the set frame would be that buildings are designed only for the able body, so it would keep this the disabled as a marginalized and segregated group in the society in a way that actually providing the access so they can on their own access the building and access workplaces integrates them into the society. So that's my second example of where an in-kind distribution gives you a kind of integration that cash doesn't. And let me now give a third example, and that's uh, consider the gender division of labor, where even today, women do most of the work in the home. Uh, if they do work, right, they're the ones who tend to have the burden of child rearing and housework. Um, well, one thing we could do is pay women for the work that they do, right? Give them cash to compensate for the child care and the elder care and the housework that they perform. Maybe that would be better than the status quo, but it wouldn't actually serve to integrate women fully, right, into the opportunity set that men have, right? What you would really want is for women to have the same choices that men have. And one way to do that would be to provide child care to everybody. So, Again, do you take the status quo as the set point, or do you try and um, you know, change it? And in kind goods sometimes change this. So, schooling, disability accommodation, and gender equality are three cases where I think in kind distribution is superior to cash distribution. But now, so that's my first argument. My first positive argument, social integration is really important and social integration is promoted in many cases by in-kind goods and cash can't substitute. Let me now give you a second argument for in-kind goods because, and this is a stronger argument, this might be my some people would say uncharitably my Stalinist argument, but I hope that you don't take it in that way. Um, and that is that there, you know, you could have in kind good provision and then allow private provision alongside it. That's a very popular idea. You have some kind of in kind uh, provision of education, as we do in the United States. But then people can buy up private versions of this. Um, they can, I've already said in the housing case, when you want to target, you might want a system where people buy up um, housing so that um, uh, maybe you don't think there's a reason to give um, everybody the same housing. We can talk about that. But there is an argument that, uh, again, Tawny and Marshall made that having some common experiences was important for a democratic society. Marshall refers to this idea when he talks about the equal social worth of all members of society, despite differences in talent, wealth, character, and luck. And he thought, as did Tawny, that there's a psychology that's needed for people to actually see and respond to each other as equals. And they thought um, that this uh, psychology is threatened when people live completely different lives from each other. And here's a quote from Tawny criticizing the British system of private schooling. I guess you use public or private, but anyway, you know what I'm talking about. It's the same way around as in the US. Yeah. <laughs> um, it is, here's Tom. It is at once an educational monstrosity and a grave national misfortune 
It is educationally vicious since to mix with comparisons from homes of different types is an important part of the young, of the education of the young. It is socially disastrous for it does more than any other cause except capitalism itself to perpetuate the division of the nation into classes of which one is almost unintelligible to the other. So this is a democratic argument against private schooling. It's not meant to be a leveling down argument. Um, you might worry that you know it's a leveling down, but it actually has a positive. It's not a leveling down because you're benefiting the people on the bottom by creating this system of what we could call forced solidarity. That's the Stalin's piece. Um, and you know, um, the argument here is that any democratic society composed of people who are different requires some common experiences, some common institutions where everyone is an equal foot, on an equal footing and everyone is treated the same. And we have very few of those spaces left. I can say I just flew here. You know, when I was growing up, everybody was in one line at the airport. Now there are multiple lines. People have private planes. People have private substitutes for almost everything. Um, and we are segmented, right, by um, on so many um, on so many uh, dimensions. And one of the things that happens when people live lives that are totally apart from each other um, is in particular that the rich can drift off in their own world and insulate themselves from the travails of the ordinary person. And I don't know if, any, if you saw it, but the New York Times interviewed the children of billionaires uh, they were complaining about how hard it is to have all that money. And you just read that and thought they're like in another world. Um, they really don't understand what most people face. And that's important because often the privileged parts of society are in a position of lawmaking. Um, and one at least I mean, Whole I feel is that um, people who are making decisions, it's better when they're in the same position as the people on whose behalf they're making the decisions. It's much easier to impose costs on others that you don't have to bear. And that's going to then come to my third and final argument for in kind provision, which is protecting the vulnerable. Um, so here's an example that surprised um, policymakers. So I'm old enough to remember now, I think when seatbelts were first introduced in the United States. And when they were first introduced, only the driver um, got the seatbelt and nobody else in the car needed to wear a seatbelt. And what was the result of that? Well, the result was actually more fatalities than before, right? Which nobody expected, right? Everybody thought, like, this will be, you know, get rid of some of the fatalities. But actually, you can see what happened, right? The drivers now felt safer and were able to take risks that, of course, the fellow passengers or the pedestrians, right, weren't protected against. And so that led to more fatalities. Sometimes if you want to protect the most vulnerable person, you want to put everybody in the same position. So the, um, so let me sum up so far. In-kind goods can be efficient. They can um, uh, meet the paternalist objection. And um, in a positive way, they can support social integration. They can promote egalitarian attitudes and psychology, and they can protect the vulnerable. But now let me turn 
to two objections, not the Stalinist objection, but the two other objections. So one objection is um, to say, you know, fine, this is kind of an idealized picture you're presenting, but if you really look at what happens when you have these in-kind goods, but you allow lots of inequality in income, inequality in income just flows right into all the things that you're worried about. So for example, take um, uh, elections, right? We have all kinds of election laws in the United States, but money flows all over the place um, to give the wealthy disproportionate influence on elections. And every time they try to close up a hole, the wealthy find another hole. It's a little bit like the tax system, right? Every time you close up a tax hole in the United States, like 50 holes um, open up. So one objection is, well, maybe you're right that cash can't do everything, but cash really matters. <laughs> so I take that as a friendly objection because I'm not intending to claim uh, that the degree of cash inequality that exists in most developed societies is a good thing. Um, and I take the point that it is often really hard to stop money from flowing into these arenas that you try to block off. Not impossible, but very hard. So this is not meant to substitute, just like I said, cash should substitute for in-kind provision or can't. In-kind provision can't substitute for um, some cash redistribution. However, the, the reasons for the cash distribution are gonna look similar to the reasons for the in-kind distribution, that is, they're going to be democratic reasons. Um, so that's one objection. So just again, I want to clarify, I'm not making an argument against uh, taxation. Um, second, okay, maybe it's the case that um, you don't have to be a paternalist in order to deliver goods in kind. But isn't it still a worrying restriction on freedom? I mean, after all, um, you might think if we're obligated, right, the argument I've given, we're obligated to give people access to these in-kind goods, aren't we also obligated to make them use the in-kind goods? Um, supposing a person like wants to eat you give to some food stamps and they have it on, you use it for junk food. Um, supposing it's you, um, actually Donald Trump argued that food stamps should be tied to canned goods um, because they didn't spoil, people would waste them. So, you know, maybe um, uh, we should force people to take them up. So I don't think we need to force people to take up the in-kind goods. I think my obligation to you is satisfied by providing you with the access, but then I accept that there are autonomy reasons to allow people to make a choice about whether they want to actually use the good or not. You can't force somebody to um, uh, go to the doctor. If they don't want to go to the doctor, you can force them or you can sign them up as a default in health care, but you can't force them. You shouldn't have to force them to use it. There are some cases where I might bite the bullet, um, and those are cases where low take-up actually undermines the set of democratic institutions. And one kind of interesting case, and I have a colleague writing a defense of mandatory voting, um, you know, that you run problems with democratic legitimacy when only a very small percentage of the population is voting. 
So maybe there is an argument for sometimes forcing people to take up opt-in kind goods, but I don't think it always follows that because I think my obligation is satisfied by your having the ability to do it. Then if you decide, you know, I want to worship my God and I don't want to take it up where there's no like public health reason or no third party effects, you should be able to choose not to do it in many, many cases. Okay. So I'm sure there are other objections, which I'm looking forward to discussing with all of you. Um, I want to just um, uh, close by noting, as I said at the beginning, um, there's some reasons, I think, to be skeptical of um, uh, proposals like for basic income that are often seen as addressing the worst aspects of uh, inequality. And um, they certainly do address some aspect of inequality. And I've said, yeah, inequality, there's a reason to be concerned about but they can't substitute for these other kinds of goods. And one interesting case to think about is work, right? The experience of work. I haven't talked about that. Our workplaces, <coughs> at least um, for many of us in the US, are probably among the most diverse uh, places that uh, we, we function in. Um, and they actually serve a lot of important democratic ends by bringing people together. You don't choose many of the people that you work with. You don't know what their politics are. You're dealing with people with, you know, you have disagreement. Again, from the point of view of the psychology that's needed to maintain democratic institutions, workplaces are really, really important. Um, so to close. Um, I've given four reasons to care about income education. One, as I said, social integration. There are some ends that society has that we need if we're going to keep our institutions stable over time um, that can't easily be, be brought into the calculus of individual action. And uh, among those, I also take protection of the vulnerable, as in the um, seatbelt case. Sometimes you actually need to have common, you know, solutions that are provided and not allow individual um, segmentation. Second, I've said there can be efficiency benefits when groups are given in kind. Uh, that might be the case of childcare or targeting. Giving money alone is insufficient to discharge the obligations we have with one another. That was part of the negative argument. And now on the positive side, there are psychological, relational benefits of giving some goods in kind equally to all, as opposed to simply dispersing money. The argument I've made is not paternalist, and it brings us closer to an ideal of social justice that inspired the development of the modern welfare state. Its founders and architects saw the welfare state not as a provider of handouts or even a wise paternalist intervener. Instead, they saw in the goods that the welfare state would provide, which limited the domain of the market, free schooling, free health services, public housing, job training, the, deli the delivery um, of a society in which citizens can relate to each other as free and equal members. I'm gonna close with a quote of Tawny who captures this ideal much more eloquently than I ever could. So here's Tawny in his book, Equality writing quote what is repulsive is not that one man should earn more than others for where community of environment and a common education and habit of life have bred a common tradition of respect and consideration these details of the counting house are forgotten or ignored 
it is that some classes, what's repulsive, it is that some classes should be excluded from the heritage of civilization which others enjoy, and that the fact of human fellowship, which is ultimate and profound, should be obscured by economic contrasts, which are trivial and superficial. What is important is not that all men should receive the same pecuniary income. It is that the surplus resources of society should be husbanded and applied, that it is a matter of minor significance whether they receive it or not. With that, I'll stop. Questions, objections? Yeah. Oh, um, so, so thanks, Sarah. It was a really um, interesting talk. You really expanded my idea of what um, in kind of benefit actually could be. I don't think you really thought about um, education or education. So I was thinking a bit more in terms of the benefit system, I suppose. Um, but in any case, my, my question, I'm afraid, is it all, all, all challenges to an example you gave? Was a very rich example I thought, which was um, that concerning the gender division of labour. So, so you said if, if you have a, the two kind of policy proposals that you could have there, so, so one would be to provide childcare, uh, you know, state funded childcare, and the other would be to provide an income to, uh, to caretakers who are you know, usually women who come in a sense as well as the police. Um, now, it seems to me that I, you know, I can somewhat see the argument there, but I suppose we have the third option. Woman can choose whether she takes the income for her for doing the childcare herself or receives the state childcare. It seems that would be a preferable option, you know. And if you're if you're making an argument in terms of efficiency, which you, you did for, for your proposal there, then that would seem to be a yet more efficient option to, 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 to have that choice because women often do actually want to participate in childcare for, for parts of their lives, you know. Um, I I have a baby with my, my wife and I have a baby at the moment and we know various people, um, you know, in our professional jobs, who you know choose to have a longer period of childcare than they need to have. And they, oh, sorry, of, uh, of maternity leave, and maternity leave, than they would need to have, you know, because they would spend more time with the baby, you know, after twelve months, even though you're not really getting paid at this university, you're not getting paid anything after nine months. But people will still do that for free, rather than take up the, the childcare that's actually available and quite reasonable. So, so it seems to me that that. Basically, that it would be it would be good to have the choice, right? People kind of women can either take up the, the income, um, maybe especially women who are in a more precarious financial position would be a good option for them. Um, or they or they can use a child rather than you know, either or. So that's a good challenge. Um, it's why it's interesting that you know why not add this to a list? And I I do think sometimes we want to add income distribution to a list, but I. I guess I'm going to push back drawing on, um, you know, sometimes when an option is available and there's disagreement in families about what the best way of dealing with something is, um, that option, adding that option might lead women to take um, a less good outcome as, in, you know, so families are you know, wonderful, but there are also disagreements. Also employers, right? It's costly for employers to make work more flexible and to do things to accommodate two workers as opposed to the old model of a, a woman at home. So I'm not sure it's superior, right, to have that option. I'll, I'll tell you something, this is now in my dean's role uh, that I've been struggling with. Uh, so, because you, you mentioned paternity and maternity leave. So, we've observed over quite a long period of time that when our male professors take paternity leave, which they do, they write like tons of articles. And when our female professors take maternity leave, they actually do child care and don't get a lot published. And that actually creates a dilemma. <laughs> Because on the one hand, you're trying to change norms with paternity leave. On the other hand, you realize, you know, 
it's not giving you exactly what you, the outcome you want. And in fact, it might be making things worse. I tried, so this is again the Stalin side, I tried to get the university to accept a diaper test. Like every man who takes fraternity leave has to change a diaper after like you know three months and if they can't change a diaper, it gets pulled back. But uh, nobody else can go for that. So. I'm the test. <laughs> we all say that. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. I must say I agree with most of what you said. I just wanted to ask you something about the the initial threshold of efficiency objection to implant distribution. Could you not simply go back to the free market tier of implant objection and say you're working with a completely skewed understanding of efficiency, okay. one that already receives a market metric? Because if most of the examples were of practices that are held up to standards okay. and efficiency, which of course measures how well they stand up to those standards. So you could say that efficiency is in kind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm not willing to throw out the more generic uh, version of efficiency. I actually think there's some, even though efficiency has weak moral content, I do think it has some moral content as a general notion, which is we shouldn't waste resources. Right, uh, and if we're going to waste resources, we should have a reason for doing that. But isn't waste already a very low concept? Well, it's, yes, it's loaded, and then, but I, but I do think it's loaded and it isn't. I mean, so one, I think you can actually give a reason why some values might be more important than efficiency, and that you again you want to restrict the scope of your efficiency arguments, but I'm not willing to say, to throw out all the um, ideas of efficiency as a kind of mathematical notion. So I'm not willing to go quite as far as that. So I'm trying to say you can accept the economist's view about efficiency, you know, for these purposes, but still think in kind distribution isn't necessarily inefficient. But then e even if you think it's inefficient, the positive argument says there's another value, call it a value of you know democratic equality, that might lead you to take a less efficient um, solution. Right? So efficiency isn't the only thing that matters. So my question is, what's so good about goods? Um, so, uh, you know, well, uh, let's not run it again, but, you know, Morkin's mm -hmm. um, critique of, of roles, why goods are not, are not what we should uh, aim for. And one of the reasons he gives is not uh, anti-paternalism, as you know, but it's mm -hmm. rather, um, it's unfairness, you know, if I, if you give everyone an equal amount of apples, those who have apple directed plans of life are going to be um, uh, better off systematically than the, than the non apple lovers, and that extends to all goods. So, what I'm missing here is at what level of generality this is supposed to occur. If it's an account of the public policy and what we should do as a matter of public policy, sure, you're right. But if, if it's about what uh, uh, what matters and what a liberal or egalitarian or socialist policy should do, then neither cash, I'd say neither cash, nor more goods. What matters is what we can do with the goods, what the goods do, goods do to us, blah, blah, blah. So what, what, would, you, what would you say? Uh, What's the level of generality that we're talking here? What's the, the, the principled idea? So I think the principled idea is this idea of democratic relations and democratic equality, and that cash and in-kind goods have a place in that, in achieving that ideal. Um, and so it isn't, I mean, remember the good, it's not fetishizing the goods. 
it's what the goods allow you to do. So take social integration. That's not a thing that you have, right? That's something that you achieve, right? Or society achieves by distributing in, in kind in this way. So the focus is on democratic relations between people and inclusion as an equal, and that some cash provisions in the gender case, in the disability case, don't do anything to change, right? The marginalization of, uh, and the segregation of various people in a society, which is not a democratic idea. But these are not speaking goods. Mm -hmm. These are values, the democratic values, mm -hmm. and they're realizing. Okay, right. Yeah, the democratic values that I think in kind good distribution realizes. Right, so the argument isn't fetishizing the in-kind goods. It's saying if you accept that kind of argument, right, that you know, democracy has preconditions, including psychological as well as institutional preconditions, it says, look, in order to achieve that, you have to distribute some goods in kind and uh, disallow bias. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, very thought-provoking lecture. Particularly enjoyed going back to Tony. And of course, one of the questions that is best known or best remembered about is: Does Britain still want to be run by old Etonians? And that was a hundred years ago. And the answer, hundred years ago, <laughs> seems still to be yes. It is. Uh, um, but I was struck by uh, you know, the objection that you labeled for certain people have labeled Stalinist mm -hmm. because common experience amongst it doesn't seem to be Stalin. Okay. Uh, putting millions of people in gulags and starving is yeah, yeah, yeah. a fair Stalinist objection. It's an uncharitable criticism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so it seems to me that the you know that this frame of reference might be slightly different. Um, which leads to the question: If you were to to identify the the main obstacle in the United States to the kind of uh, program that you're talking about, uh, what would it be? And, and, and might it just be right wing economists? <laughs> um, you know, certainly um, neoliberal, what it's called neoliberalism, has had a huge effect on, in the United States um, and to a lesser extent in, in England. But uh, is it, I mean, there are it was a goal. I don't know if it was a golden age in every um, dimension. Certainly, it was not a golden age for African Americans, although they were making gains between World War II and the kind of mid early 1970s. And then those neoliberal ideas, conservative economics, took off, and people believed it, even though there wasn't a lot of empirical argument, it was a model, and it went pretty badly wrong. And has, they're in a very bad position right now. So yes, and there are two ways to respond to that. One, again, is to focus on income inequality, which a lot of economists are now, more economists are doing now than did in the, um, in the neoliberal period. But Another way is to bring up this issue of income goods. So, and the, you know, I would say the United States, in its extreme and under the influence of the uh, um, neoliberal economists, has less in-kind good distribution than just about any other right developed society. It's very and as a, thank God for the DMV because there really isn't any people have in common. I mean, there is also, I said it wasn't going to make this, but there is also an argument here about um, military service, because again, um, both the argument that you're uh, giving a cost on others that you're not willing to give on your own, right? So a lot of data, like the rich always get out of, you know, military service and don't participate in it. Um, and it's outsourced to a small section of the community. And actually the military 
was one of the biggest institutions advancing um, racial equality, right? Much earlier than any other institution. And it's people are brought together and they have a common purpose um, and they have to achieve that purpose. And so, and, so, and, and by the way, the reason we got rid of uh, military service in the United States, which isn't widely known, is because Milton Friedman uh, argued that military service was a form of involuntary servitude and incompatible with liberal values and got to policymakers and influenced policymakers in the next, early 1970s to get rid of the draft. I agree, but that's a, that's a longer discussion. I, I, I'm a lecturer of European Union law here in Glasgow, so I'm very sympathetic to your argument because <clears throat> the European Union has been practicing distribution and kind, building up an identity in the education system, which curiously might not be as democratic as that. So I, I, I'm very sympathetic with the argument, but I, I thought of three objections. I don't know if you covered them already. Um, so the first one is that in-kind goods are more exclusionary than money because they can, there can be a, a limited supply or the, the polity itself could be different than, than the nation. So for example, you know, you distribute education in kind, if people don't have higher education, maybe they're not compensated for that. They don't get an equal amount of money than a university course would give. Or for example, people living in a, a city, a big city like here in the UK, people living in big cities and in the countryside, they, they get all these goods in kind in city, and then they try to give them the same in kind in, in, in the countryside or in smaller cities, and it's enabled because there, there are limits to it. Whereas if you give them money, uh, you wouldn't have this exclusionary element. So that's the exclusionary element to be the first objection. The second objection would be that money makes comparisons easier. And it's when you think of all the examples of in-kind goods that you mentioned, one thing in common of all of them is that they're generally considered better. I mean, childcare, uh, education, disability. Mm -hmm. We give access to buildings, build up ramps for disabled people. You don't truly really compensate them for, mm -hmm. for disability. In fact, it, it's almost like making us discharge our conscience when we're doing something that doesn't even approach what is needed. If there was money, you could compare. Money makes good comparison, makes better competitors than in kind good. And thirdly, in relation to the, sorry about this, I've just been accumulating that, as you said. You mentioned the psychological aspect, but there's a, a, a big problem with the psychological aspect, which is people overvalue in kind goods. So here in the UK, I find it curious that, you know, a number that's been thrown around is that you spend 10 times as much trying to detect fraud in, in loans to students than in tax fraud. It just feels that sometimes when people partake of the in-kind goods, it generates all sorts of hostile reactions. The welfare tourism, again, in the, in the European Union is a big issue, supposedly a big issue, whereas no one begrudges anyone that spends money. So if, what if, if you give money, maybe you overcome all of the biases that, that people overvalue in in kind of goods. Right, great, thank you. Um, so I didn't cover these, so let me um, try to respond to them. And I'm gonna take them in the opposite order because I think the first one is the hardest to exclude any objection. So the overvalue, people overvalue cash. People overvalue the status quo, correct? There's all kinds of biases. People overvalue what they have, period. So it isn't, you don't get rid of that problem if you distribute cash. Like one of the reasons taxation is not so popular among many people is they think they're entitled to their initial distribution, right? What the market gives them. And it's very, you know, that's just, there's a built-in bias towards the status quo. Um, so I think it's, it could be true about incumbents, but if it is, it's just as true about cash. Measurement, absolutely. It's so I said I didn't want to give up on the mathematics because I think you know measurement and comparability is um, 
and Gordon value, you know, and Gordon, not value, lever and policy. But life is complex and some things are harder to measure, um, but they aren't less important because they're harder to measure. And so, you know, well, you know, preference satisfaction, you can measure. It's really hard to measure autonomy, but it's a really important value for people. Um, so the fact that autonomy is harder to measure isn't an argument for not thinking it's an important value. So I take your point about measurement. I mean, you know, Rawls, just to um, bring up Rawls for a second, says income and wealth are a proxy for what's really important. What's most important is what he calls the social basis of self-respect. And we're just using money as an imperfect proxy. And here I'm emphasizing how imperfect it is in some cases, right? It really isn't sufficient, let's say in the disability accommodation case. And, okay, but that brings me to your other point, the first point about exclusion. And are we really, you know, um, compensating and um, including people by giving them in kind. Wouldn't we do better? Um, we, you know, if we didn't have a bounded, you know, uh, set of goods and a bounded community, that's the efficiency argument in effect, right? We're kind of not going to do this well. Um, and I guess I, I do see that there is, I am accepting some kind of exclusionary, uh, I have an exclusionary argument here of one kind, which is I started from the idea of democratic polity, and that's less than the entire globe. Cash is much easier, again, but simple, send cash. I actually think sending cash is not a, often the most ideal way to help poor people outside the United States or outside that sometimes the best way is in kind. And I gave you an example of the Indian uh, uh, women. Uh, but I take the point that that's an exclusion. Whether or not we would do better for the disabled if we didn't you know, change the way we build buildings and change like the devices we use at work so many different kinds of people can use them whether we would do better by just giving them cash is actually what i'm thinking on so i i do think i mean it's actually amazing you know to to think about the level of uh people with disability going to university now compared to what it was 10 years ago, right? I mean, there's just been a dramatic change and part of the dramatic change has to do with accessibility. I'm, I'm talking here about physical disabilities, not mental disabilities. Um, it's just much, you know, you can actually go to a lab, right? At Stanford, you can be a chemist. You couldn't be a chemist you know, 40 years ago, if you were in a wheelchair, there wasn't room. So I, I do think that there were changes. You did make the point about exclusion that I think, again, is an important point about, um, look, what about the people who don't go to university? Like, you're not, what are you giving that? Well, there, I do think we owe, we have other things that we owe people. I'm not sure we owe everybody a university education. I do think if we don't provide it, I mean, I think we owe the access to a university education, but some people won't take it. And I actually think it's a bad thing about at least American society, that if you don't go to university, you're disadvantaged on, on every other dimension. And that's what you really need to create multiple routes for people who don't take up right, the good of, let's say, a college education to be successful and to have decent lives, and we don't do that. Partly, you could do that, though. I mean, in the United States, access to college is tied to access to health care because most low-paying jobs um, don't have access to health care. So that's 
So there are a lot of people wanting to ask questions, but we're afraid we're running out of time. So let me take one more question and then we'll, we'll conclude the whole part of the evening. So questions over here. So I have two questions actually. I wonder if you ever thought about considering the efficiency critique uh, against the ideas of economies of scale. Uh, of course, if there is a central procurement uh, agency, this could lead to other kinds of efficiency, but then this even go up another layer and uh, provide a discussion between free markets and this central pay uh, or state pending and so on. So this could lead to another discussion. The other is <clears throat> I'm currently living in Sweden, and then of course high taxes, wide uh, network of social protection, but importantly the wage inequality is quite low. So this is one case. But I'm originally from Brazil, so uh, we also have a relatively uh, wide network of social protection, but wage inequality is a huge problem. Uh, the most successful program that uh, reduced inequality was actually cash transfer. Yeah, the so progressive program. Yeah. yeah. So uh, direct cash transfers directed to women and also uh, real increases in the minimum wage. So my question is, if this wouldn't be a matter of mode of delivery, but the actual ethics behind it. So the goal was to either in Sweden and Brazil to reduce inequality in the first place, and both ways work uh, at implementing Yeah, that's a good, that's it. You know, so I'm not making, uh, a again a priori argument. I'm and maybe I am in some cases, but I agree. I mean, the program of paying parents to keep their kids in school was very, very successful. It's one of the examples of the very successful. You didn't deliver it in kind, but you used cash and you got the outcome that you wanted. So I'm not, we could, I mean, I actually in a part of the paper I cut. I talk about, um, you know, you could take um, cash vouchers for schools and you want to achieve an integrated school system. You could design the voucher system so that you give extra points, you know, or extra amounts of money to people with certain characteristics that you want school to include in different kinds of schools, right? And so the schools would be more likely to take those people. So it isn't that you can't, rig up um, a cash situation that could help you know forward some goal it's just that it isn't always the case and sometimes as i said i think the disability case is my strongest case i actually think it can't deliver it there um, the voucher you know vouchers are complicated school choice systems are complicated cash the role of cash here is complicated so I think the disability case is one where you know I've been challenged on it. I'm going to stick to there is a goal. There is something you can achieve through in giving accommodation in kind as opposed to accommodation in care because I don't think it achieves the same thing. Your first point was just on uh, economies of scale and the inefficiency, the efficiencies of economies of scale. So yes, although um, sometimes that also leads to, so you get economies of scale because they're upset often because they're more efficient <coughs> and at larger firms, but then those large firms block the next generation of firms, which is inefficient. So there is, like I said, it's more complicated and it might be that you have to, that there are reasons sometimes to break up large firms because they are black on future innovation. Anyway, but that's, again, outside my wheelhouse. Okay, well, so thank you very much. Uh, concludes the question. <laughs>